Now we start tonight with breaking news. Rust movie armor Hannah Gutierrez Reed has been found guilty of involuntary manslaughter for her role in that deadly shooting that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins. But the jury decided she was not guilty of evidence tampering, and that verdict came down quick. Just hours after closing arguments where prosecutors did not mince words, they called Gutierrez Reed careless and thoughtless in failing to prevent live ammo from ending up on that set. I'm not telling you that Hannah Gutierrez intended to bring live rounds on set. I'm telling you that she was negligent. She was careless. She was thoughtless. This was a game of Russian roulette every time an actor had a gun with dummies. It seems like the jury agreed. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffith joins us now from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, Dana, that deliberation did not take long at all, right? How, how did we end up here? Yeah, Gotti, after two and a half weeks of testimony and two and a half hours of deliberations, they came to that decision. I asked one of the jurors outside of court, what was it? What was that key piece of evidence that came, that brought them to their decision? Listen to what he told me. If you have live rounds there and you don't even know it and you're not checking them, there's a problem. <laughs> was everyone pretty much unanimous? Anyone push back? Not really. We had little differences, but about 2%. And why not guilty on the cocaine? We didn't just think it was necessary. It wasn't something that was mattered. Was there not enough, you know? Yeah, kids? there was nothing there. There was just like, give it to somebody. Who knows? Could have been anything. So there you have it. There was nothing there for that evidence tampering charge. So, again, because she's been convicted on one of those charges, she faces up to 18 months in prison. Gotti? Uh, Dana, what a fascinating post-trial interview there. I got to ask, what was the vibe in court when that verdict was being read? All was quiet. I think when you started hearing those audible gasps from her mother happened when the judge decided to remand Hannah to prison. That was something a lot of people did not expect because she has been out since the shooting. She has not gone to jail. We've been interacting with her. And so there was a moment when she had to stand up. The officers escorted her out. Her mother was sobbing. Hannah turned around, said, bye, you guys. Her mother said, love you, honey. And then Hannah blew a kiss to her sobbing mother. Her mother was furious. She got up, started saying expletives, obviously not happy about this. Outside of court, the defense says that they do not believe that there was enough evidence to convict her and that they plan to appeal. Gotti? And Alec Baldwin's trial, we've got that just a couple of months away now. How many of the arguments that we saw in yep. this trial are going to reappear in Baldwin's trial? I mean, Baldwin's name came up constantly throughout this trial. So he's going to, so a lot of the arguments that we heard from him rushing actors, him not being safe with weapons, those are some of the things that are going to come up in his trial if it, go, if it goes as planned in July. And even during closing arguments, his name was brought up once again by the prosecutor. I want to read what she said in court. She said Baldwin's conduct in that church on that day is something he will have to answer for. Not with you today. That will be with another jury on another day. So we obviously heard a lot of evidence presented today, even that the defense brought up. They say he pulled the trigger and that the script did not call for him to fully pull his weapon out of his holster. So that is going to be key when he goes to trial and some of the mistakes that he allegedly made. Gotti? Dana Griffith, can't thank you enough for your incredible coverage on this case. Thanks. And turning now to the presidential race and what may come as a shock to no one today, we saw Nikki Haley officially drop out of the race after losing all but one state to Donald Trump on Super Tuesday. And really, for those watching closely, the question wasn't if she would end her campaign, but what she would do after she called it quits. What happens to all the money she raised? Is she really not going to try to be Trump's VP? Uh, and what does this all mean for Haley supporters who were turned off by Trump's brand of MAGA? It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. At its best, politics is about bringing people into your cause, not turning them away. And our conservative cause badly needs more people. 
Uh, meanwhile, a lot of Democrats saw Super Tuesday as a blowout for President Biden. He is now more than halfway towards officially clinching the nomination. And tomorrow, he'll be given his State of the Union address. Donald Trump announcing on Truth Social that he'll be doing a live play-by-play -play to, quote, correct any and all inaccurate statements made by the president and saying he's ready to go head-to-head -head with Biden in a debate anytime, anywhere, any place. For more, let's bring in NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard. Uh, Vaughn, uh, with Haley out of the race, I got to ask this. Uh, why are we still going to hold primaries? <laughs> well, let's see. Number one, statutorily in states, voters, even if there's no other option, they do get that opportunity. But here's the other part of this is that the convention for Republicans is until the middle of July. And so, uh, you know, God bless the former president and may all go uh, all right health wise for him. But also there is a process that continues and Nikki Haley's name, others, they will still be on the ballots in those places. Delegates will still be apportioned out. And so in the scenario, anything were to happen, each of these states ahead will give their delegates out to somebody. And so each of these different candidates, including Donald Trump, will go to that convention with a certain number of delegates, Nikki Haley included. So in case anything were to happen, that's why this process will continue. The backup plan, conventions. <laughs> Let's listen to uh, some Correct. of what Haley's supporters had to say after she suspended her campaign today. Take a look. I'm disappointed that she's out. Uh, that doesn't give us very good options at this point. So she would have been the person I probably would have voted for if she was still running. Disappointed. I mean, I'd like to have seen somebody else make the uh, Republican nomination. I'd like to see the Republican Party be a party again because it's uh, in utter chaos and the leaders don't have a clue what they're doing. All right, so the big question now is what does Donald Trump have to do to win over those kind of voters or possibly President Biden? Right. And look, Nikki Haley today said on the stage that it's up to Donald Trump to win over not only her personally, but those very voters. And that convention that I mentioned in July in Milwaukee, that's when all the Republicans and the delegates that formally would nominate Donald Trump to be the Republican candidate for president will all gather. And you usually see all the prominent Republican elected officials. And usually you'd see even that Republican candidates former rivals. You could expect to see the likes of Tim Scott, probably even Ron DeSantis there. Well, Nikki Haley show up and tried to begin to help make the case that Republicans, as Donald Trump says she should, should unite around him in order to advance the more conservative agenda come 2025. And that's the outstanding question, though, is you're looking at that part of electorate that arguably won uh, Joe Biden in the White House back in 2020 after they fled Donald Trump from 2016. So can Donald Trump even win a share of those voters back? His campaign has made the case in a Biden-Trump rematch that most uh, of those voters they believe will come back to them, even without Nikki Haley, you know, saying, hey, go support Donald Trump. But, you know, that's what the next eight months ahead of this general election are for, Gotti. And Vaughn, finally, I know that Arizona is near and dear to your heart. I got to say, I was pretty surprised by uh, Arizona's Democrat turned independent Kirsten Sinema and, and the news that she's not going to seek reelection. Let's listen to what she said. The only political victories that matter these days are symbolic. Attacking your opponents on cable news or social media. Compromise is a dirty word. We've arrived at that crossroad and we chose anger and division. I believe in my approach, but it's not what America wants right now. Because I choose civility, understanding, listening, working together to get stuff done, I will leave the Senate at the end of this year. I mean, she's not wrong there, but how's the race looking to replace her? Is this a potential pickup for Republicans looking to take back control of the Senate, especially in a place like Arizona? Right. This was a three person race. When she became an independent, there was a Democrat, Congressman Ruben Gallego, who announced his own Senate bid. And then there's Carrie Lake, the Republican, who uh, she lost narrowly for governor back in 2022. She's a close ally to Donald Trump. She is running for the U.S. Senate again. She's likely going to be the Republican nominee. So now you have a two person matchup here to fill Kirsten Sinema's shoes because Kirsten Sinema was only garnering about 15 to 25 percent in the polls. And you heard her say there that it was clear to her that Americans and Arizonans don't want somebody like her right now. And so the question is, in that head to head matchup in the longtime conservative state of Arizona, 
could uh, the Democrats hold on to the Senate seat? And that's what Ruben Gallego is looking to do. But also it's Joe Biden who won that state in 2020 by just 11,000 votes. So this is going to be front and center state uh, here in 2024 for the Republicans and Democrats, not only for that Senate race, but also for the White House. Scotty. Von Hilliard, thanks so much, brother. And the Supreme Court has set a date to decide whether Donald Trump is actually immune from criminal prosecution on those charges of election interference. Now, that date is April 25th, the last day of the court's calendar, which is exactly one month after Trump goes to trial in New York on that hush money criminal case. And it'll be a busy stretch for Trump after that, with two other federal trials in Georgia and Florida, all before Election Day. So let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Angela Sinadella. Uh, Angela, April 25th is more than seven weeks away here. It's the last day of the docket, right? Are you surprised that the justices are waiting that long? Is this on purpose? Gotti, I have to say I am not surprised. And I understand that to lay people, it seems like they are not moving fast enough. But I have to tell you, the Supreme Court is extremely busy. They see 100 to 150 cases per term. Their April calendar is already very full for the Supreme Court, squeezing them in on April 25th, which is a Thursday, and they don't usually even have Thursday sessions, is to them moving quickly. So I don't see this as a political decision. I see this as them trying to squeeze in what they believe is a momentous case in the midst of a very busy season, Gotti. Do you think this case or any of the cases will be decided before Election Day? What do you what do you think is going to happen? Yes. So, Gotti, I actually do think that this case will be, and less so because of SCOTUS, but more so because of the Judge Chutkin, who is overseeing this D.C. case. And that's because, let's go over the timeline. So, it appears that April will be when the arguments will be heard, and it is likely that by the end of June, if not earlier, they could always give a decision earlier in May or whenever they want. They will then have some sort of a decision, and it is my firm belief the decision will not be that Trump will have total immunity and that this case will just disappear. I believe the case will be remanded back to the district court, and the trial will then begin. At that point, there's about a couple months that are re required for pretrial motions, and then Chutkin can start her trial. Because Chutkin, from the very beginning, has been so intent on making sure that this trial will happen prior to the election, she has broad discretion, and I believe that she will almost force it if indeed it is remanded. So that means we're at about August, September, and by that point, a trial could happen, Gotti. Yeah, I was just trying to do the math there with a couple of months for pretrial motions, that uh, August, September, uh, even possibly October, right? That is a very crunchy timeline. Very close to the election, you know, but that's what we're seeing, Gotti. Angela Sinandela, thank you so much. And turning now to Georgia and the effort to get a Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis booted from her election interference case against Donald Trump today, a Republican-led Senate panel gave the floor to one of Trump's lawyers who continues to accuse Willis of having an improper relationship with her special prosecutor. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander has more. Well, Gotti, what we're watching right now is these allegations against Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis that we've been covering for the past two months. They've now spilled over from the Fulton County Courthouse to the Georgia State House. So that happened in the form of a committee meeting earlier today. Now, to be very clear, this is a Republican-led state Senate committee. They actually have very little power if they find wrongdoing on Willis's part. They can either refer the case to another body or they can recommend new, new laws to try and curb something like this in the future. Now, that's the practical matter. But politically is a very different story. Republicans tell me that they feel they have a duty to actually investigate any alleged impropriety. The chairman tells me that he expects this to last for many months. He will likely subpoena Willis in the months to come, saying that he wants to hear from her, and if she doesn't come voluntarily, then a subpoena is something that they would explore. And Democrats say that this is nothing but a politically motivated action, basically saying, one, as one committee member told me, that it's a way to take the focus off of Donald Trump and put it on Fonnie Willis. Now, we we actually heard from Fonnie Willis herself. The state capitol was very busy today. Fonnie Willis came to actually qualify to run for re-election, and we asked her about the committee meeting that happened earlier today. Take a look. Well, I think it's all just a political quest. I think that people are angry because I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to stand up um, for justice, no matter who is the person that um, may have done wrong in Fulton County. And so they can continue on with their games and I'm going to continue to do the work of the people. 
Now, Gotti, what we are watching very closely, of course, is what's happening a couple of blocks away at the Fulton County Courthouse. That's where Judge Scott McAfee is going to decide whether or not Fonnie Willis can remain on this case, can keep prosecuting this case in light of the motion to dismiss her and have her disqualified. The judge said that he plans to make a ruling on that by next Friday. Gotti. Blaine Alexander, thanks so much. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. We're going to bring you the latest on this warehouse explosion in Michigan that killed at least one teenager. And an Oregon dad was arrested after allegedly drugging his 12-year-old daughter's friends during a sleepover. We're going to have the details on that investigation. And later this hour in the future of everything, the new tech you could soon see at the airport that might just make those security checkpoints go by a little bit quicker. That's all coming up a little later this, later this hour. So stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. We're going to have more on that deadly explosion in Michigan and what caused it in just a moment. But first, here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Just hours ago, the Alabama, Alabama State House voted to approve a bill to protect, protect IVF clinics from lawsuits. It now goes to the governor's desk, who has said she'll sign it. The bill says that IVF process could still face civil suits, but no criminal prosecution. And a 16-year-old is fighting for her life after she, after she was shot nine times during a mass shooting near a SEPTA bus in Philadelphia. Seven other teens were hurt but are in stable condition. And this is a fourth shooting near a SEPTA property in the last four days. And three kids were among five Canadians who died in a plane crash in a highway near Nashville. The F NTSB says the flight tried to land at a Nashville airport, but the pilot reported engine and power failure. Investigators are looking into that crash. And subway riders in New York City can expect to see a lot more officers on the platform soon. Governor Kathy Hochul announced plans to send 750 National Guard soldiers to patrol the subway and check riders and bags. The governor said riders have the right to refuse the bag checks. And today, the FDA cleared the first over-the-counter monitor that continuously checks blood sugar levels. It's a sensor that you wear that pairs with a smartphone, and it's meant for adults who don't use insulin and treat diabetes with oral medication. It's due to hit store shelves this summer. And tonight, investigators are searching for answers after a teenager was killed in a massive industrial fire in Detroit. On Monday, a vape distribution warehouse essentially exploded, shaking nearby homes and sending debris flying as far as two miles away. What I felt was the whole world, the earth shaking. It was, uh, it was, it was, pr it was pretty bad and scary. Um, it never stopped. It never stopped. The explosions never stopped. And investigators say the warehouse had stocked explosive materials, including canisters of butane and nitrous oxide in the past. A 19-year-old was killed in that explosion, and a firefighter had to be taken to the hospital. Let's bring in NBC News' Adrian Broadus with the latest. Adrian, uh, debris flying two miles in the air, I, that sounds just insane. Uh, do we know how this happened? Terrifying indeed, Gotti. Investigators are still trying to determine what caused this spark. I spoke with the fire chief who says his investigators don't anticipate searching this explosion site until early next week. Two reasons why. One, the area must be safe for those fire investigators. And two, they're focusing their attention on the first phase of the investigation, which includes interviewing. Let's talk about what was here one building which contained at least three businesses. We will tell you about two of them. One was a smoke shop. The other, as you mentioned, supplied vape products. It was supposed to be retail only. That's according to city officials. Instead, officials say that nitrous oxide and lighter fluid was stored in a back room. Also here, at least 100,000 vape pens with lithium batteries, but that's not all. One of the businesses recently received a semi-load shipment of butane canisters. Those weren't permitted. Listen in. Then, after all of our inspections, they somehow, in the meantime, brought things in the back door that shouldn't have been there. Illegal containers of liquids that explode. And when the city inspected, just so I'm clear, that was in 2022. Yes. 2022. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No canisters. None. None. We would not have allowed it for obvious reasons. It's dangerous. 
And you heard the supervisor there saying the canisters were not there at the time of the inspection in 2022. And it's those canisters that also exploded and went flying into the air, hitting one 19-year-old who later died from a head injury. His family is now planning his funeral, which is set for Friday. Gotti? Ah, heartbreaking. That area, it, it still seems like it would be very dangerous with canisters flying, you know, so far away from the from the ground zero there. Are they still looking for canisters or, or other potential material that has spread out from where the explosion happened? Those canisters still remain a big concern. The city is working to bring in an outside agency to clear the debris, but people were showing up here throughout the day, picking up the canisters, taking them away as a souvenir. And that is what city officials do not want people to do because those canisters could still explode. There were some minor explosions today, which reemerged or led to small fires. Uh, we saw firefighters here earlier in the day pouring water on the area, trying to put out those hot spots. And those canisters, when they explode and break, they're dangerous, very sharp metal. It would be awful if those canisters fell into the hands of a young child and injured a child or someone else. Gotti. Absolutely. NBC's Adrian Broaddus, thanks so much. And coming up, extreme weather is getting more and more dangerous. We're going to talk specifics about what's causing it and what you can expect in the next few years. But first, you've got to see this. Earlier this week, a three-year-old accidentally bottled out of his home in Michigan without his parents knowing. Well, you're looking at dash cam uh, video or actually body cam video of a canine, Kuno, who was put on the case. Uh, he started tracking his footprints, led search crews to some water where they found that little boy safe and get this for Kuno. And it's just another day at work. This is his fifth kid he's found in his career. Let's give him a quick round of applause. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back, and here are some of the stories we're following out here in the West. California voters are sending Adam Schiff and former Dodgers star Steve Garvey to face off this November for the Senate seat left open by the passing of Dianne Feinstein. Now, this is a huge blow for Democrats Katie Porter and Barbara Lee, who will have to leave their House seats at the end of their terms. A Schiff, who is also a Democrat, is controversially under fire for spending millions in attack ads that ended up boosting Garvey, a Republican, and effectively locking out Porter and Lee. And San Francisco has just passed a measure that sent a pretty clear message to city leaders there. Voters want more done about public drug abuse, and that measure, Prop F, which was backed by the mayor, will drug screen those who receive welfare. San Francisco set a record last year with 806 overdose deaths, mostly from fentanyl. And a woman in Phoenix, Arizona, had the surprise of her life. She found a rattlesnake curled up in the back seat of her car, and apparently it had been there for um, two whole weeks. The woman said that nightmare made itself at home, never hissed, never rattled its tail, and her boyfriend was able to fling that snake out of the car using a broken tree branch. Yikes. And this next story is beyond terrifying for any parent. Imagine sending your kid to a sleepover with their friends and then finding out they may have been drugged by another parent. Well, in Oregon, those are the allegations against a man facing felony charges accused of drugging three 12-year-old girls with homemade smoothies at his daughter's sleepover last year. And police arrested the 57-year-old last week, six months after it allegedly happened. He was indicted on nine counts, including giving a controlled substance to a minor. And court documents show the girls also told police that the dad was acting so weird that one of the friends sent this frantic text message to her mom begging for her to pick her up because she just didn't feel safe. NBC News correspondent Mar Barrett has more. Gotti, the details are incredibly disturbing. We're learning a lot from an affidavit of probable cause followed by the girls and their parents after the incident happened. Immediately, we do find out in this affidavit that the girls were taken to the hospital after the incident happened. They did test positive for benzodiazepine. That's a sedative drug. It's a controlled substance, so obviously something very serious. And basically, the affidavit lays out that the girls got together for a spa sleepover night. They were going to do face masks and watch a movie, uh, and the father 
father, Michael Maiden, made them smoothies. And he was very particular about which girl got which smoothie. He wanted them each to have two servings. Each of the girl's uh, smoothies had very specific color-coded reusable straws, and he got upset when they tried to switch the smoothies. Uh, so it was very confusing in that sense, but very intentional, it seemed. So one of the girls noticed uh, that it, things were off, and she didn't want to drink as much of the smoothie. The other three girls did. The one that didn't drink as much noticed throughout the night that the father was kind of hovering in the basement as the girls were falling asleep. He kind of was wandering around while they were sleeping. She says that she pretended to be asleep, and she was so concerned that she frantically texted her parents, that panic-driven text uh, that you mentioned, uh, asking for them to come and get her. She frantically texted other friends. The other girls ultimately uh, were able to be picked up by their parents because the first girl got picked up. They, they got the other parents involved. Uh, but the girls reported that they were woozy. They felt like they had blacked out. Uh, they couldn't balance for up to 12 hours after the fact. So again, incredibly disturbing uh, and chilling that this could happen uh, at a sleepover. As for the father, we haven't heard directly from him, though we do know he, that he turned himself into authorities just last week. His lawyer, though, uh, speaking out, saying that nothing is proven yet, that the case was brought before the grand jury, quote, in secrecy with no judge or defense attorney. He asked that people reserve judgment until all the facts are known. But we do know that the father is indicted on nine felony charges, all surrounding uh, the force, the forcefulness of, of ingesting controlled substances, especially when it comes uh, to minors. So we'll just be following the developments on this story in court. Scotty. Oh, so disturbing. Mara Barrett, thank you so much. And a massive cyber attack on a healthcare giant is causing chaos all across the country. This is affecting everyone from hospitals to doctors, doctor's offices, pharmacies, patients. And NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has the latest. Thank you for calling Magnolia Pharmacy. At Magnolia Pharmacy in Los Angeles, it's been two weeks of chaos. It's impacting everybody, pharmacies, patients. The pharmacy left in limbo from a cyber attack on Change Healthcare, the nation's largest medical claims processing company that for days has prevented many providers from filling patients' prescriptions. This pharmacy has moved to an entirely new server so they can now process their prescriptions, but it's not a perfect fix. They still can't look at patients' insurance information or take coupons for name brand drugs. Sometimes it takes one hour to two hours for one single patient to find their insurance. Change, which is owned by United Health Group, says it processes 15 billion transactions a year and works across more than 67,000 pharmacies. The $590 we paid out of pocket yesterday. And Sienna Keller you know, says she had no choice but to pay out of pocket for what her stepdaughter needs to treat her diabetes. That's a lot of money. Yeah, then I don't know how much longer we can really afford to go through it. Tonight, Change Healthcare not responding to reports it's believed to have paid a $22 million ransom to the hackers. In a statement, the company saying it is working closely with law enforcement and that it's implemented workarounds to help bring some systems back online. In the meantime, experts say patients should ask their doctors about obtaining drug samples or lower cost alternatives. This system needs to get fixed. A massive disruption showing how vulnerable and interconnected our healthcare system is. Liz Kreutz, NBC News, Los Angeles. Liz, thanks for that. Now, it looks like the popularity of weight loss drugs like Ozempic and Wegovy starting to have a big impact on businesses all across America. And now they're even starting to reshape how fitness clubs are trying to win over members. Here's NBC News correspondent Emily Akeda. As weight loss drugs soar in popularity and make shedding pounds easier than ever. I have worked out three to five times a week since being on this medication. America's gyms are working up a sweat to assure they're not left behind in this new age of health and wellness. We're now trying to figure out how can we assist people in getting the best possible results. Equinox is among the fitness clubs leaning in, launching curated training programs for members on weight loss drugs. People need to maintain a really good exercise regimen and a, a nutrition regimen on top of it. Exponential Fitness acquired a chain of weight loss medical clinics, while Lifetime is piloting an on-site clinic that provides access to doctors who can prescribe weight loss medications to eligible members. While some trainers say they're losing clients to weight loss drugs, many industry analysts believe gyms, luxury or not, stand to benefit. Planet Fitness calling the drugs a tailwind for our industry. 40 pounds ago, 
This girl was not going into a Pilates class. As some patients find new confidence to start working out. It's super important to try to build your muscle. And look to stave off muscle loss, a potential side effect of such medications. Doctors say those taking weight loss drugs should stay in touch with the healthcare team to monitor any potential side effects. Practice strength training like body weight squats and resistance bands and avoid exercising on an empty stomach. What's at stake for those who do not do any strength training on these kinds of drugs? If you don't move your body and you don't do some resistance activity, you're at risk for uh, losing more of the muscle mass as we age and we lose that muscle mass that we're going to have you know, more troubles and more issues over time. Dr. Angela Fitch says nausea is a common initial side effect of the drugs and that new patients should take exercise slow at first. I felt I had a little bit of nausea and within a week after taking it, probably my second shot, I felt a lot better. I started my workout routine again. Emily Iketa, NBC News. Emily, thank you. Now, if you notice the price of those hamburgers are going up, you are not alone, but industry leaders say your beef with these rising prices is not their fault. NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans has more. Hey there, it's no secret Americans love to dig into a juicy burger. What they don't like, digging deeper into their wallets to pay for it. Restaurant owners blame the rising cost of ingredients and operations, but sticker-shocked consumers say enough is enough. It's a popular spot for a burger, fries, and more. But this morning, rising prices at Five Guys, making some customers lose their appetites. So I'm just wondering why the food here is so pricey. One tweet going viral, calling the cost of a meal out of control, along with this receipt, apparently showing a $22 price tag for a bacon cheeseburger, regular soda, and little fry. People grilling the popular burger chain on social media. This is a fast food restaurant. Why is a burger $12.50? But Five Guys is not alone. The price of eating at restaurants rising higher than the rate of inflation in the last 12 months. Limited service meals like fast food are up 5.8% over the past year, while full service meals at sit-down restaurants increased 4.3%. Eating away from home is about 30% more expensive than it was in 2019. But now a lot of these restaurants realize they really just can't raise prices anymore. I think customers are at a breaking point. Increasingly high fast food prices leaving a bitter taste for consumers hungry for a good deal on a quick bite. Almost $9 for a Big Mac. With reports on social media of an $18 Big Mac meal at one Connecticut rest stop. The Baconator you love? And even Wendy's announcing it plans to test dynamic pricing, charging different prices for the same items based on demand throughout the day. Nearly all restaurant owners say they're facing higher operating and labor costs, and food prices are up too. In Milwaukee, Nas Musa is navigating those challenges. At his restaurant, Casablanca, he's implementing innovative ways in an effort not to pass costs Onto his customers. Now we're making our own pure bread, and that saved us a lot of money. The Wall Street Journal reporting more than half of small business owners, like restaurateurs, said higher labor costs are their biggest source of inflation. NBC News reached out to Five Guys for comment, but did not hear back. Back to you. Christine, thanks so much. And forecasters say we just had one of the hottest Februarys on record, but it's not just us. Winter weather all over the world brought temperatures almost three degrees hotter than average. And here's NBC's national climate reporter Chase Kane on why we are seeing seasons get shorter and hotter and all the extreme weather that comes with it. Blizzard conditions brought more than seven feet of snow to California. At the same time, one of the biggest wildfires in U.S. history burned across Texas and Oklahoma. Days earlier, more than 100 cities hit record highs as rare tornadoes hit Chicago and for the first time in Wisconsin in the month of February. All of this extreme weather is set against the backdrop of record heat around the world. And we know that the hotter Earth gets because of climate change, it can make weather events more extreme and more frequent. You can think of climate change as a force multiplier in many respects. So where we would have had drought in the past, we may have more severe drought where we would have had uh, storms. We may have more extreme storms or bigger storms or slower storms. So it is that multiplier of effect and forces and numbers in many cases, too. And as we continue burning fossil fuels, that multiplier is getting stronger. Earth just clocked its ninth record hot month in a row, following the hottest year on record and the hottest winter on record for parts of the U.S., from central California to the Midwest and New England. 
The consequences may not always be extreme, but they are impactful. I biked up here in shorts and a t-shirt and then went ice skating in shorts and a t-shirt. What's that about? You could ski, you could golf. Right after ski, you could play around the golf. It's great. Minnesota canceled its ice festival because of a lack of ice. Now golf courses there are opening months early. And in Washington, the cherry blossoms are on track for another early bloom. Another sign, winter is America's fastest warming season. And looking ahead, it's not like this global heat is going anywhere. And that can have an impact on everything from severe storms to Atlantic hurricane season. Spring is already arriving ahead of schedule in parts of the U.S., which could mean that summer also arrives ahead of schedule, bringing extreme dangerous heat even earlier in the year and lasting longer. In San Francisco, I'm National Climate Reporter Chase Kane. Chase, thank you. And breaking just now, some more election results from here in Los Angeles are just coming in. It looks like L.A. County D.A. George Gascon is headed to a runoff election for his re-election re bid. He's going to compete with whoever gets the second most votes from Tuesday's primary, which are still being counted. There are 11 other names on that list. Of course, we're going to keep an eye on these election results and bring you uh, them as soon as they come in to the NBC News Decision Desk. And coming up, we are going to tell you more about the Civil War are brewing in Haiti right now, and two people have died after Houthi rebels fired missiles at a ship in the Red Sea. Now, these are the first fatalities since the group started their attacks back in November, and we're going to cover those headlines and a lot more stories from around the world after the break. Hey, welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. Uh, Ukraine is saying it sunk another Russian warship in the Black Sea, doing so yesterday using high-tech sea drones. And Russian authorities have yet to confirm that attack. But Ukraine says about 20% of Russian missile attacks on Ukraine come from Russian ships in the Black Sea. And a gang leader in Haiti is threatening civil war, and that's exactly what will happen if Haiti's prime minister doesn't step down. Gangs control about 80% of the capital city of Port-au-Prince. Those gangs attacked Haiti's main airport on Monday, along with several prisons, freeing thousands of inmates. And by now, you might have heard all about this tea surrounding Princess Kate, who has been out of the spotlight for a bit. Now, the UK government says she's going to attend a local ceremony in June, which would be her first public appearance since abdominal surgery back in January. But the announcement has caused some confusion because palace officials have not confirmed that this is the case. And now to the Middle East, where Houthi rebels have hit another commercial ship with missiles, this time killing at least three people on board. Now, this is the first deadly missile strike since the Iran-backed group started launching attacks around the Red Sea back in October. And NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Cuby has the details. Scotty, today for the first time, an attack by the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen proved fatal. Today, the Houthi rebels fired an anti-ship ballistic missile at a cargo ship in the Gulf of Aden, the MV True Confidence. It struck that ship, killing three of the civilian mariners on board. And we're just learning late tonight that four others were injured, including three critical. Now, that anti-ship ballistic missile struck the ship after they had some communication back and forth with the Houthis who told them to move away from the area. The ship issued a distress call and a number of coalition warships moved into the area. But at that point, the crew had already abandoned the vessel, which was had, had suffered severe structural damage and was on fire. Now, this is the first time that one of these Houthi attacks has led to the death of one of the civilian mariners. Gotti, it's not the first time that they have actually had a successful strike on a ship. We saw only days ago after the strike on the Ruby Mar also led to severe structural damage and a fire on that ship. Well, the ship sank over the weekend. There's a lot of concern right now about the 40 tons of fertilizer on board and what could possibly happen to that concern here at the Pentagon that it could lead to some sort of an environmental disaster. But also concern about the fact that as the U.S. and others, including the British military, have continued to carry out strikes against the Houthis, they do not seem to be deterring them from going after ships in the region. Gotti. Courtney Kuby, thanks so much. And in Ukraine, a blast rocked the port city of Odessa earlier today, all while President Vladimir Zelensky and Greece's prime minister were in town. And NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley has more. 
Well, it's only been a few hours since this attack, and the president of Ukraine said that there were deaths and injuries, but we don't have the casualty numbers quite yet. But even as we're still getting more information, the thing that already makes this Russian strike stand out from among so many thousands of others over the past more than two years is that it happened just as the Greek prime minister was visiting Odessa. And in fact, the blast happened only a few hundred meters away from pre where President Zelensky was taking the Greek prime minister on a tour of the city, showing him damage that the city had taken from previous Russian attacks. So as this is going on, this kind of comes at a critical time. Neither the Greek prime minister nor President Zelensky said anything to indicate that this could have been a deliberate attack on them. But to them, to Zelensky and to the Greek prime minister, this just goes to show and as a reminder to the world that Ukraine is still under a sustained assault by Russia. Uh, and this is something that is critical at this very moment, just as Western countries, especially the United States, are rethinking aid to Ukraine and wondering whether the high cost of providing military aid to Ukraine is worth it considering now, when you look at the east of the country, Ukraine is finally losing a lot of ground after two years of Russia's just relentless assault. The Ukrainians have put up quite a fight, but they are now running out of ammunition. And all of this is critical. They're trying to hold the line as the Russians appear to not be as depleted as they were in the recent past. They seem to be being able to mount a sustained offensive and pushing the Ukrainians to the west. Now, that's something that is certainly going to be alarming for Zelensky, and it's one of the reasons why he's pushing so hard for more aid. NBC's Matt Bradley in London, thanks so much. And before we go, it is time for the future of everything. And airport security lines, they are annoyingly long, right? But maybe things are going to get better. TSA is testing out some new scanners that might help with that mad dash through the airport, and that is coming up after the break, so stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. There are some new TSA tech you might want to know about for the next time you head to the airport. We're going to tell you that in just a second. But first, here are the tech stories we are watching tonight in the future of everything. AI researchers are calling out companies like OpenAI and Meta for not doing enough safety testing. Over 100 researchers signed an open letter asking the companies to allow independent investigators to safety test their programs. Now, as the rule stands right now, auditors can get banned or possibly even sued we're testing out the models. And in other AI news, one Microsoft engineer is warning people about the company's generative software called Copilot Designer. It's one of those programs that makes pictures based on text prompts. Now, this engineer is saying that Microsoft's tool is creating violent sexual images for certain prompts and that even though he reported it to Microsoft, they're doing nothing about it. Microsoft told CNBC that they are committed to addressing employee concerns, but didn't say whether they were going to take the product down. We've all had to deal with super long security lines at the airport. Some of us may be even cutting it extremely close to our flights because of them. Well, now TSA is starting to test out a new self-scanning system that's supposed to speed up that process. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello shows us how the tech works. It's been 23 years since TSA was stood up. Today, screening two and a half million people every day at 440 airports nationwide. Every carry-on, every suitcase, every passenger screened and cleared. But now the TSA is testing what could be a faster checkpoint of the future. It was great, quick, no hassle. A self checkpoint, much like self grocery checkouts, almost the entire screening process is self guided, more automated, allowing TSA officers to keep eyes on security. What did you think? I, th I liked it. I think it's a lot easier. But it's not gone without hiccups. Gloria from New York was rushing to catch a flight. It took me four or five minutes to yeah. even get through. What was the hang up? Supposedly my wash, my hair clip, and my jacket. Starting today, a six month the trial run in Las Vegas, reserved for pre-check flyers only who know the routine. Some of this will be familiar to regular travelers. Come up to the checkpoint, take your carry-on, put it in the bin. If you've got any questions, simply ask the TSA officer on demand. Hi there, how may I help you today? TSA officers will dial in remotely. Place everything in the bin. Yes, and when you're all done, go ahead and slide your items forward. Slide your bin onto the rollers, then walk right into the full body scanner. And this is what's new. You come in and you put your arms down to the side, and it's going to look for anything that shouldn't be there. 
and it's telling me I got to come back out. I have a microphone, of course, that it's detected. I've got the transmitter on my belt and something a lot of people forget, my cell phone. Bags that require rescreening cycle back automatically. After testing the checkpoint, the TSA will decide whether any of it can be rolled out nationally. Are you expecting too much of passengers to expect that they can do this on their own? We don't know. We've never tried this before. This is something that uh, is a first here. TSA Chief David Pekoski. Don't expect this to be widely rolled out at every airport and every checkpoint. No, I don't think so. Part of what we're trying to do here is to figure out, hey, what works? What facilitates movement of people? Uh, while at the same time making sure that we can provide the security we provide. Our future is getting fast. <laughs> and we have to be fast. Whether the self-checkout is faster. Somebody's got to be the guinea pig. <laughs> might require working out the kinks. Would you recommend this? No, probably not. Tom Costello, NBC News. Tom, thank you. Here's hoping. And finally, let's talk about the future of nuclear power and artificial intelligence. For some, those particular words together is a scary thought. For others, it might even bring back memories of disasters like Chernobyl or Three Mile Island. But there is a new generation of entrepreneurs out of Silicon Valley that want to build newer, safer nuclear power plants. And those might be the future that can power AI. Jake Ward has more. As you know, nuclear power has more or less stalled in this country. But now a new group of Silicon Valley funded companies is building prototype reactors, at least they hope to, in remote places like this. Is this the climate friendly energy solution we need or is this turning back to a technology that Americans have been done with for decades? This remote site in eastern Idaho could soon be the birthplace of a new nuclear age. The reprocessing and refabrication of highly radioactive fuel. The Idaho National Lab is a research facility where, in the 1970s and 80s, the U.S. government experimented with a safer kind of nuclear reactor. T minus one minute. The federal government put their early research reactors out here because it's full of underground water and, frankly, there's no one out here. Decades after the plant stopped running, a Silicon Valley-backed company wants to build a new version, a 15-megawatt reactor called Aurora. We'll be installing a fuel fabrication line in here and making fuel for our, for our plant. The reactor will use liquid metal as coolant and leftover nuclear waste from the government as fuel. So this is the place where they will recover the fuel that you need? Yeah, and then we'll fabricate it. The company's CEO has been working in nuclear since he was 16 and envisions his reactor powering a town or a factory. For most of my life, there's not been a question about the demand for what nuclear energy is, which is reliable, clean, affordable. I mean, those are all attributes people want. And big tech wants it, too. Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and a host of VC firms have invested in several nuclear companies. There's like a long history of humans and machines working together. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman is chairman of Oklo's board and speaks openly about requiring huge amounts of power for the data centers that make AI possible. This is like a desperate need for as much energy as we can manufacture. But this is not an unregulated technology like AI. This is nuclear, where the waste from even new reactor designs like Oklo's will remain dangerously radioactive for centuries. <laughs> In 2022, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission told Oklo they had not provided enough safety information. DeWitt says the company is working to satisfy regulators. You've got new physics, you have to use new models, you have to do all sorts of stuff that's different than what they're used to. A lot of things that they're used to don't apply, but they have to do their independent job of ensuring this meets adequate safety requirements. In nearby Idaho Falls, folks seem pretty comfortable with the idea. I think it's great. We've had it before. Right. So at this point, you'd say you're pretty comfortable with nuclear power. Oh, yeah. 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 A growing number of Americans feel the same. But critics argue that nuclear solves a problem for tech CEOs, not for humanity. If you were to integrate large language models, GPT style models into search engines, it's going to cost, you know, five times as much environmentally as standard search. I want to see innovation in this country. I just want the scope of innovation to be determined beyond, you know, the incentive structures of this these giant companies. Couldn't we just cut back on our energy consumption? Why do we need more to feed our society more and more and more power? Yeah, I'm going to answer that in two ways. We've almost always seen a direct correlation between energy abundance, in other words, high energy footprints, and pretty much all, all aspects of quality of life. Not to mention, we're also trying to decarbonize. We are still so far away from electrifying vehicles, mm -hmm. and the amount of energy we're going to need to do that 
is huge. Now, on the one hand, this really raises just a logistical question, right? I mean, if we're going to electrify everything from cars to kitchen ranges, well, we're going to need vastly more power than we currently produce in this country. But the other question here is philosophical, right? Why are we building these? Are we doing it just to serve the interests of the companies that want to make AI products and EVs and need a way to power them? Or is this, in fact, serving humanity's interests at large? Should we be trying to create new power sources or learning to live with less power? That's the question in front of us. Back to you. That's such an important question, Jake. And I still can't get over the fact that you did that interview in an ancient control room for a nuclear reactor. So cool. Thank you so much for that reporting. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.